hi and welcome to Ruach, which stands for Religious Understanding and Community Harmony. Ruach also means spirit or breath of God. And it is our time for different faith leaders in Lynn to come together and talk about the important issues in our lives and in our times. Uh, my name is Rabbi Margie Klein Ronkin, and I am with the Essex County Community Organization and Congregation Sheree Shalom. And I will let my congregants introduce themselves in a moment. But today, I want to welcome you to our show on civic responsibility. So we'll be talking more about that. Um, but let me just turn it over and just ask my fellow clergy to share your names and congregations. Hi, my name is Father Brian Flynn. I'm the pastor of the Lynn Catholic Collaborative of St. Mary's and Sacred Heart here in Lynn. Hello, I'm Andre Bennett, Reverend Andre Bennett from Zion Baptist Church here in Lynn. And I'm Pastor John Licketh from First Lutheran Church in Lynn in Wyoming Square. Well, welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being here with us. So just to start out, civic responsibility, can we just, can you just share when you hear those words, what does civic responsibility mean? What does it mean to you? How have you experienced it? So I remember my parents saying that they had civics class uh, growing up. I did not. We had a class in government, but which was very different, I think. But when I think of civic responsibility, it's being an engaged member of the community in which you live and, and the nation. So uh, paying attention to what's going on uh, in terms of politics and uh, issues that affect us all and being, you know, voting, uh, paying, be, uh, knowing the candidates and the issues and, and, and getting out there and, and playing an active role, um, holding um, elected officials accountable uh, to their promises and um, sort of putting the common good ahead of one's own individual um, uh, needs or desires, the commonwealth of Massachusetts, that, that we're in this together. Um, so those are the things that I think of. Um, for me, I think that um, civic responsibilities um, had a, an entirely different meaning. Um, well, it had dual meanings. Um, growing up in a country like Jamaica, um, uh, there were civic responsibilities for non-religious people, and there were civic responsibilities for religious people. And civic responsibilities for non-religious people were, you know, you get involved in your community actions, and and you know, you go out and you organize people to. To, to vote and to do whatever they need to do for the upliftment and the development of the community. And then the Christian community, your civic responsibility was, you know, you go out and you talk to people, you witness to people about God, not realizing that that was evangelizing as, as against <laughs> civic, civic duty. But, um, you know, as I got older uh, um, and, and, and became more of my own individual, um, when I think of civic responsibilities, I think of um, assisting in any way possible to make um, my community um, a better place, a more united place, and to get people engaged in the, the discussions that affect our lives on a daily basis. So that's, that's, that's my idea of civic responsibilities. With uh, John's description very much, I think my upbringing, it was much the same. Um, I do think, though, I, I grew up in a small town, and even as a teenager, and I remember, like everybody in the town, being in some way expected to take a role or have some civic responsibility, even if, you know, at a minimum, voting or, or going to the town meeting. You know, it used to always be the town meeting would be on local cable TV, and you would see them almost like scolding the people. You know, we need more people to get here to make the decisions uh, for, uh, for the small town. And it was just kind of expected. And I remember my parents in some way uh, playing some role in the town. I mean, not elected officials or something, but perhaps assisting with, uh, you know, the fundraising for the library or things like that, just things that you did. Um, and I think the other thing I remember in, in somewhat contrast, I think, to many experiences now is uh, 
there's a lot of civility in civics, you know, in the civic responsibility. You could have those conversations and I think people would go more with an open mind and listening to one another, engaging one another, as opposed to coming in with the feeling, I'm right and you're wrong and you're not going to change my mind and I'm probably, probably not going to change yours either. Yeah, so I grew up in New York City, which is a really big place, and it's a place where, you know, it's very hard to have, as one person, to have a big role in politics. But I also grew up at this small Jewish day school that uh, my parents helped found that was sort of a social justice-themed Jewish day school. So the way I was taught it was the community is going to do well or not based on our decisions. We are completely responsible for whether thing, how things are. And that doesn't just mean in our community, that means in all of New York City and in all of the world, which is sort of a heavy burden to put on like a five-year-old. But, you know, so for me, there was a sense that like you have ultimate civic responsibility. So sure, you can pay your taxes and you can vote. But beyond that, if you believe that something needs to change, you have to do everything that you can. And in the Jewish community, because historically, you know, most of our history, we didn't have our own land. We were living under other governments. And most of the time, those governments didn't want to have that much to do with taking care of the Jewish community, the Jewish community created all sorts of internal institutions to take care of ourselves. So there's almost civic responsibility within the Jewish community that teaches people ha those skills so that there's a really disproportionate number of Jewish people that are involved in broader civic responsibility activities because, you know, we're completely taught that, you know, we have to, well, there's a teaching, you know, that, if your brother falls low and becomes poor, it's your job to raise him up. So we all got involved in all of the, the local organizations. Or if someone was sick, my school had a thing where every single time a kid missed school, we all took turns calling that person. And we all made cards for them. And I think that for me, what civic responsibility means is taking ownership of the well-being of the community not just focusing focusing on your own um, your own needs. So um, I'm just interested. I just shared a little bit of you know how Jewish tradition uh, understands civic responsibility. How in the different Christian traditions that you're from um, have you learned about civic responsibility? I know you shared a little bit about that, Reverend Andre, in terms of. Um, well, witnessing you know, <laughs> to the masses about Jesus. Well, well you know, um, again, um, it, I've been exposed to a complete reculturalization when I came here, um, being, you know, a minister, an active minister, and then getting very active in community organizing and, you know, meeting with politicians and, 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 and uh, you know, leading campaigns and stuff like that. Um, because I remember growing up, uh, you know, when I was nine years old, I guess because I was doing well academically, um, they had me sit the exit entrance exam. And I, you know, I was successful in that. And I started high school at nine years old. And being in high school at nine years old <laughs> <laughs> was a nightmare <laughs> on many different levels. Um, I had skipped a bunch of grades. Um, and so when I, when, I, when I am sitting in class, I was completely lost. Um, but not only that, I was the smallest, shortest, skinniest, and youngest kid in the, in the entire school, and everybody knew that. And then the other piece to that is that every parent wished their child was that child. <laughs> and so, of course, all the kids hated me. <laughs> and of course, I was struggling. And so I started this, this movement to have that abolished where kids could be forced pretty much to sit the exam to get to high school if they're doing academically well or they're performing above grade level. And I remember my grandmother who, you know, was a very faithful and committed Baptist member, a member of the Jamaica Baptist Union, which is where I was um, as well. At that time, I used to direct the youth choir and I used to, you know, I was the assistant um, Sunday school superintendent at nine, <laughs> at nine years. <laughs> and, you know, I, th this movement that I started, I, you know, just 
struggling in high school really and decided to have a conversation with my guidance counselor and she said well if you feel so strongly about it you need to write a letter to the Department of Education and let them know how you feel and you know over time she helped me pen the letter and I wrote the letter and it you know gained traction and before I knew it I was getting national attention and my grandmother who you know again was serving the Baptist Church for probably about 45 years at this time one morning she one Saturday morning you know she sat me down and with tears in her eyes and her voice breaking she said well you know um, th those people at the school are letting the devil get the better of you because that's the devil's work. You know, you don't mix, uh, as, as a young man who everybody thought, and, and rightly so I guess, that I was going to end up in ministry and my grandmother was ensuring that I be groomed for the pastorate, you don't get involved in political work. You, it's, it's the devil's work, you know what I mean? And then, but there was something in me that felt like it is my responsibility, even if I'm a minister, even if, you know, I direct my youth choir and I, you know, I teach Sunday school and I do have kids, even at nine years old, that looked to me for some kind of leadership. I felt like I had a responsibility to ensure that not only when they come to church, they are well and okay and, you know, we sing and we put, but they should be okay within the community. There are issues that are affecting them that they, they, they need a voice. And so I had that struggle for many years and I never got the support of the church community because again, church is your civil responsibility for church is you go out you distribute the tracks you tell people Jesus love you you tell them the church door is open come to church and you leave everything else so it was when when I when I came here and came to a congregation that for the for the most part embrace um, civil responsibilities within the pulpit it was like wow I kind of found home to some extent but it was also somewhat of a culture shock because I didn't have much people pushing back on the work that I was doing so I think there are is a, a spectrum of, of, of ways that Christians have or do navigate this question of civic responsibility I mean I think the, what you grew up with was probably far on, on one end. What I grew up with, I didn't grow up as a Lutheran. I grew up in a, what you might call an evangelical or, or fundamentalist church. And, and it was not that politics or was the devil, but it was, there was a very clear distinction between the civic realm and the spiritual realm. You know, there's a, there's a passage in scripture about we're citizens of another kingdom that's from above and we're sort of strangers in this world. And so the focus or, or sort of the, 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 the purpose of religious uh, teaching and um, formation was for the next life and to maybe affect personal morality uh, in various ways, but, but not with any sort of um, uh, the next step that it would impact society as a whole. You know, God wants me to be a, a good person and to, to follow these at that time, you know, a lot of a lot of times around sexual ethics and things like that. That was what was emphasized, but but not societal. The idea that that, that we need to um, come together to take responsibility for our, our community. The religious right in the '80s sort of maybe changed that, and, and as as certain people like Pat Robertson and it got and tried to get seats at the table with 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 certain political issues, um, but still. In my, in, even though I've, I've moved from that tradition, there's, I still notice sometimes a tension about politics in the pulpit. Um, well, but I think personally, um, I did experience a transformation of seeing my faith as this personal interior thing, which was between me and God, and, and, and sort of reading the scriptures again with an eye towards what, what, what do the uh, teachings of Jesus have to say about the way we live together in community. And that's something that, that happened, you know, I can't say later in life because I'm not that old, but, but certainly not in my early formative years, college, seminary, and, and, and still to this day. Um, and, and so now I would see that there's a lot of overlap. I still think that there is... Um, there's a piece of, of the Christian tradition that, it, that is about this interior, the, the, to know yourself as loved and um, accepted by God, no matter what. 
but then where do we go from there? Then the, the, that, of course, that 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 means we um, want to spread that not in a proselytizing sort of way, but to bring that love to bear on the world. And it's a complicated tension for a lot of uh, people who preach, um, but probably complicated for a lot of people in the pews too, trying to sort out loyalties they have to various um, civic organizations or political parties and what they're hearing and trying to process as a person of faith. Yeah, I think uh, thinking about it in the Christian tradition, uh, what I first thought about was that early church that you read about in the Acts of the Apostles, where that the people came together, brought everything they had, and supported the community to make sure everybody had what they needed. Now, you know, the argument there is that, well, they thought Jesus was coming back pretty soon, so nobody was worried about sharing because they didn't think they would need it themselves, or so they weren't worried about supporting the community because uh, they didn't think they would have to do it for too long. But I think it's important, as I speak to my congregations now, to use that as, well, that's what we're called. And, you know, and, and then uh, the judgment seen in Matthew, you know, whatever you did for the least of my brothers, you did for me, that supporting of the community and that sharing. I saw that in, uh, again, growing up in my own parish in a small town south of Boston. We ran a, uh, like a thrift shop and I used to always think that was good. That was kind of like our small way of doing that. But then you realize that uh, the people, often the people at the, who were running the thrift shop weren't doing it for the right reasons. It wasn't this sharing. It was kind of this, in a sense, we're better than these people and we can do this, so we're going to give them our extra type of thing. And I just don't think it really... Uh, they didn't quite get it. I shouldn't say all of them. Maybe I was misreading it. I was younger, but it just kind of seemed uh, that was the attitude. But we use, I use that idea of, from the scripture in trying to get, you know, my parishes to do the work that we try to do. But I will say that when we were writing, uh, we, had, we were writing a, a definition of discipleship for the collaborative to try intentional discipleship. And that's a fairly... Uh, long, fairly long definition with how we nurture that discipleship. And then the last section was, and this discipleship is there so we can go forth and change the world. Again, there's this interior piece of it. But the toughest thing we wrestled with was what does that interior piece lead to, you know? And everybody was fine with the interior piece. But when we get to the going out and changing the city, the world, there was more, I mean, we settled on something, very happy we settled it, but there was a little bit of pushback, a little bit of discussion whether, well, a, a discipleship means taking care of me, not necessarily going out and changing. So it's still a, a struggle. I'm just thinking about some of the, um, the duality that you guys are naming between um, obligations within the religious community or for the religious community versus at large. And I'm thinking about how in the Jewish tradition, civic responsibility is huge, but the community that it's talking about is the Jewish community. And then, so in the context of the Jewish community, yes, so much civic responsibility all the time. You are a hundred, there's no separation between what's spiritual and what's communal because the way that you act out um, God's will is through doing the commandments and the commandments are half about yourself and God and half about yourself and other people. So if you want to live out half the commandments, the ones about yourself and other people, that are all about how you conduct yourself in society. And they do apply to, many of them apply to, you know, like the idea of, you know, equal weights and measures and don't cheat people, you know, that's true for everyone. But in terms of the kinds of things you're supposed to do to care for other people, they are much more focused on, um, on the Jewish community, traditionally, until maybe 300 years ago or something. Um, but throughout their tradition, there have been other voices that say, well, you know, like, for example, when people lived in medieval Spain, where there was a lot more um, cultural coexistence uh, with Muslim and Christian communities. And so then people started saying, well, what are our obligations to these people around us? 
And so everybody pretty much agreed, yes, we have these obligations, the same as we have to our own community, other community. But in that, half the people said, we had this midday darche shalom, because of, for the pursuit of peace, meaning, so that those other people don't get mad at us, you know, we're going to be nice to them because we know that most of the time people persecute us. So for the sake of peace, we are going to, you know, we'll save a life of this, you know, sort of worthless person, but, uh, but it will mean that they won't be mean to us. And then the other half of the people said, no, this other life is just as valuable and, you know, a much more universalistic uh, sense of value that says, no, you know, we, we actually just have these obligations to other people because they're created in the image of God. And that sense of there's a tension between is it, you know, just love your neighbor as yourself, as in your neighbor who's probably like you. Um, there's a debate in the Talmud. What's the most important part of the Talmud? One person says it's love your neighbor as yourself. Another person says we all descended from Adam. That's the most important, which is um, in Genesis. It says these are the generations of Adam. And the idea of that is we all come, we're all in the image of God. We all come from one person. We're all the same. So both of them are important civic responsibility principles, but one is a lot broader in terms of who it cares about. Um, and I certainly grew up in a, in a family and in a community that very much understood our responsibility in the broader, more universal sense. But there are still Jewish communities, particularly ultra-Orthodox communities who have, uh, you know, many of whom came after the Holocaust and were really terribly persecuted that sort of are like, we're on our own, you know, we'll do, we'll, we'll vote, we'll do the basic things, but then we're just going to take care of ourselves because we just don't really trust um, the rest of the world, which is understandable given their experiences, but is not, you know, that's not how I grew up. So I'm curious, um, have, what, if you can think of a time when you got to exercise your, your civic responsibility, um, or you learned about it, like, uh, what was that like? I have to go back to my, <laughs> my nine-year-old boy. Um, I liked the attention, <laughs> I liked the attention that I was getting, but I also liked the, the fact that I, people were listening um, to, and at first, I felt like I was this whiny kid who, you know, they sent you to high school knowing that you couldn't manage high school, and that's why you're making a big deal of it, because you're a flunk in school, which I really wasn't. Um, but I just wasn't fitting in socially because I had nothing in common with 14-year-olds, <laughs> 14 year you know what I mean? Um, but then the, the, the fact that in my mind at that age that I could get what we call the Minister of Education, you call the Secretary of Education here, the fact that I could get the Minister of Education to stop and listen to what I was saying, and this became something that was now being debated, and I was invited to, you call it Congress, we call it Parliament, to the House of Parliament, and um, to, to, to present my, my, my story. Um, in that moment, I realized that our voices do matter, or voices have weight, or sounds are effective as long as we make them um, make them known. And I also learned at, at that time that there will be people who don't necessarily agree with you or with what you're doing, but there will be people, and oftentimes more people, who will be positively um, affected by what you're trying to do, and you you. There is always a need for whatever, whatever the debate is, whatever the discussion is, there is always a need for it, even if it is not the most popular. Um, and, 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 and mobilizing people is such an important aspect of just growth and development. To this day, what was called a common entrance exam in Jamaica was abolished, and they had what was considered the GSAT, grade six achievement test, so you had to be 12 or 13 years old to sit that exam to get into high school. Um, and for me, that was, th that's like the shining example of what can happen when a people come together. Um, as, you know, Reverend Sprecco, who is an associate at Zion Baptist Church, always say to us that decisions are made when people show up. Um, and that was, that was a learning moment for me. I think for me it was 
less an experience and more sort of a, a theological discovery. I mean, I, I really feel like I was exposed to so little of the tradition uh, as a child and, and even um, later on that, that, that so everything about church was about being saved and it was about these very narrow, um, uh, the, 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 what we heard in sermons and what we heard in Sunday school was all about this idea of personal salvation. And the more I explored the scriptures and the more I really, especially, you know, being part of a tradition now that every single Sunday hears from the Gospels the stories of Jesus, my, my eyes were sort of open to I had this all wrong. I mean, it's from, from, you know, Amos saying, where God says, essentially, your worship services are annoying to me. If, you, <laughs> if you're not doing justice, I mean, just cut it out. And um, um, the pe passage you, you mentioned about, you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. But also um, the idea that, that Christ isn't just this the historical figure from 2,000 years ago, but that is truly present in, in our neighbor. The, my, one of my favorite stories is that of the Good Samaritan, where you're talking about who is our neighbor. The, 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 this guy falls, he gets robbed, and, and he's laying on the side of the road, and two people pass by, and it's the foreigner who helps him. And she says, who is the neighbor to this man? So that um, our neighbor is anybody who's in need not just a member of our family, of our congregation, of our tribe, but, but the, the, the part of, of my understanding of what it means to be a, a Christian is this universal view that everyone is, is my neighbor. Um, and I became much less preoccupied with getting into heaven or, or, and, and much more concerned about, you know, the, the kingdom of God, as is often, or was, Jesus would always say, it was not so much the next life, but that it was... How God wants this world to be. It's it's a uh, it's both a uh, a hope of of perhaps what 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 we will experience someday, but but that we don't we don't just sit on our laurels waiting for it to happen, but that but that God has entrusted to us a responsibility to help build that world at least imperfectly here. So, um, yeah, I think that there was more ahead changed and the, the heart followed <laughs> rather than the other way around. I think I remember an experience uh, because growing up in the Catholic Church, I, you know, again, we heard those gospel stories, but I don't remember it really being put into a lot of civic action in our parishes, particularly growing up in a white community south of Boston. But I remember when I was first ordained um, and being in a parish in Boston, a, a somewhat wealthy parish, uh, in, in a nice part of the city. And the, the gospel story that week might have been whatever you do for the least of my brothers or, or sharing your goods. It was something about that concern for others. And I remember uh, preaching, having a homily already for my parish about reflecting upon, you know, how we can share perhaps. And I remember speaking the words and just kind of them being words. But I was also asked that weekend to fill in for a priest in a poor part of the city. And when I traveled over to the poorer part of the city and I saw the people coming who did not look like my parishioners at all, who were people of you know, different nations, of different color, different languages, I realized that the homily I gave at my parish, which was directed to those who have, would no longer work for the right. people who I'm going to preach to, who are the people who have not. Mm -hmm. And it got me thinking, again, it's like a realization, oh, this is real. You know, this is not just words in the gospel and nice things to say, but there are real people out there who need that. And I think it was awakening to me to realize it has to be more than just preaching. There has to be action. There has to be that civic duty to make the difference in the lives of those people who are the least of my brothers and sisters. So that was a, a big awakening for me. Yeah, I'm just I'm thinking of uh, one formative experience I had was, I don't really know when it, I think it was when I was around eight. Um, 
at the towards the end of the Soviet Union, the um, the former Soviet Union really clamped down on religious groups and people that were observing Judaism. Uh, especially in Russia, but all over the former Soviet Union, were being um, forbidden to to uh, perform religious activities, and um, people were saying that they were being discriminated against or that they felt persecuted. And so there was this big rally um, in Washington D.C. and like. Really, like everybody that I knew, we all just got on buses and we took buses down to Washington D.C. for the Soviet Jewry rally. And, like I, I, it just was kind of like that's what you do. Now, again, that civic responsibility is really, it's it's caring for others, but it's caring for others in the Jewish community. But um, but it was just like we all went and did this thing. And I just remember being like, this is fun. <laughs> it's all my friends are on a bus and my parents' friends are on a bus and we made these really good peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for all our friends. And <coughs> there was just something exciting about, um, I mean, I didn't, kind of like what you were saying, Reverend Andre, not necessarily like the attention because I, you know, I wasn't <coughs> anything special in the march, but the, the sense that we mattered, that we had a stake in what the future would be, and that other people's lives and our own lives were going to be affected by our own actions. That felt really exciting. It felt like we are powerful, that we could actually change things. And I, I had a similar <coughs> empowering experience that really sh shifted how I thought about what I was going to do in my life when I was in college. And I uh, coordinated this, uh, the volunteers for a soup kitchen. And I was working at the soup kitchen every day, and I felt very good that I was, you know, feeding people who were in need. And then I started realizing that we weren't really changing things for the people at the soup kitchen. And the same people came day after day, the same kids came day after day, which just felt so sad that kids were growing up in a soup kitchen environment. And then a group of homeless women came to my group and said, you know, this isn't right that these kids are growing up in the soup kitchen. Will you help us work to pass a law in New Haven to uh, get more resources for moms or families with young children? And so we worked on that, and it was a referendum in New Haven, and it won. I mean, I honestly did not do that much, but I was part of it. And I was the head of the group um, at Yale University that got involved. And so when it won, it was like, what? You know, we could we could make a difference. We could do something. And for me, it was like, I just never thought that that was something regular people could do. And so, and, and the other thing was that was so inspiring was that the people who had led the civic engagement effort were homeless women. Homeless women, single moms, Almost all of them were black. So, you know, from the perspective of, you know, society, they're not treated with a lot of respect. They're like the lowest, least powerful people. And yet they were the people that felt like they could make a change. And when we were done, I sort of naively was like, okay, you guys did this. You're done. Now you just be happy because you have, you know, like some food or whatever. And they were, they, they were like, what are we going to do next? How are we going to make a difference? And there was a sense that once you do one thing and you realize that you can make a difference, then it's like, okay, I want to do more because now I understand that I have the capacity to affect things. And so that makes me believe that the world uh, as it is, doesn't have to be the way that it is, and that it can be better. Um, and so that's both really exciting, and I think it can feel like a big burden, because once you actually feel like, okay, this is my responsibility, then it's a weight on you. And so you have to learn how to live with that. I just uh, a similar idea about that action. Uh, at high school every year, we do send a high, high school students volunteer to go to Washington, D.C. for the March uh, for Life. And a lot of preparation uh, goes into preparing them for that. But I'm not sure we do a lot of, like, this is a civic response. Right. You know, you can change that. You know, you can change a law, perhaps, by doing this. But I remember one year we went down, and um, when we came back and we had a school mass, and I was preaching, I had saved the newspapers from 
the weekend that the march had gone on, and there was no mention of it in the uh -huh. newspapers. So, so the kids who were there with 500,000 people, whatever right. the number was, I said, you know, they're ignoring you, I told them. And uh, I said, they're ignoring you. Well, the next year we prepared to go, and what they said they wanted to do was they remembered that. They called the Globe, <laughs> they called the Herald, they called the TV station to say, we're going to Washington, D.C., and we want you to report that we're going. You know, so it did, even though I didn't think we had kind of like instilled that civic responsibility to them, they recognized, again, they can make a change. They weren't necessarily making it in, in, in you know, because they weren't getting that type of coverage up here. And sure enough, the newspapers did cover them that time, and, uh, uh, and you're right, and then they want to do more now. You know, now it's like, what can we do next year to kind of make it even a, a bigger event for them? So for people who are watching this, you know, who might think, oh, that sounds fun. <laughs> what do you, you know, and, and I know some of the people who watch this are retired and maybe don't have all the energy to go to Washington, D.C. all the time. You know, what are, what are ways that um, people can exercise their civic responsibility um, that we see in our community today? You know, I was at, um, I was at an event in Lowell on Saturday, I was asked to speak at, um, it's kind of like this meet and greet event hel um, held by the Kenyan community in Lowell, where they meet with all those who are running for various offices, local offices. Um, and on my way there, I called the individual that asked me to speak and I said, um, you know, I asked her, what should, what should my message? be what do you want me because she never gave me any information she's just like i want you i heard you speak and i, I want you to go and she said to me i don't know the rhythm of life or something along that line maybe and i thought about it as i drove as i drove um to lowell you know it's a it's a 40 minute drive well from peabody um and the first thing when I got there, someone came up to me that I've never met, and she said, oh, Reverend Andre, we heard so much about you. I don't know how you know I'm Reverend Andre to begin <laughs> with, was what I said to her. Um, she said to me, what can we do? You know, because when people hear about getting involved and they see actions, they want to know now, how can I get involved? And she said, what can we do? But, you know, she went on to tell me that she's, you know, barely mobile and all of that. And I said to her, you can pick up your phone and make calls to your representative offices. Um, you know, and I, I spoke with her a little bit about the criminal justice reform bill and, um, you know, various um, little things that are happening within the community. Um, when these local city councilor candidates mm -hmm. come to your door, you know, things that you can, you, you can do things like that. Your voice, it doesn't matter how insignificant you may think or someone may think an issue is you have power in your voice to speak to whoever is seeking to be elected to a public office you can make a phone call you can hand out a, 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 a track or what they call it a brochure you can sit everybody has a um, smartphone you can google information and call people up and mobilize you can sit in your living room and start a movement within your living room if you're not able to to move around and so you know the the the, the, the days where we were limited to what we can do in terms of getting involved in our community in terms of civic engagement the days when there was a limitation those days are, are long gone you know there's cell phone there's internet there's social media you know there's there's programs like this <laughs> that's that's on you know and, and and so we can be creative I my advice to people at all times get on the phone call know know who your elected officials are know what the issues of your immediate communities and districts are get on your phone call people spread the word get have a a, a, a cookie night or a, a book night or something over have people over and discuss the issues and and and, and get them out there I, I just think also like what are you passionate about you know what where do you see injustice and and identify that and and then, like you say, there's probably something going around because others see that injustice too. So either join a group that's working on that to try to correct that injustice or start your own group.
try to work on that injustice. But I think when you're passionate about something, that just makes that change easier for you to work for that change. And if you are a member of a community of faith, to, to raise up. There's usually a time of community announcements or sharing and say, hey, did you realize that the bill to help CHIPS, the, the Children's Health Insurance Bill, is expiring this week. Did you, did you know that, uh, and not necessarily telling people what to do, but, but, but helping bridge the, the, the gap between what happens in the sanctuary and what happens in the world so that people are at least informed and can, can try to engage what's happening uh, with what they believe. We actually have one guy at our church, um, he's, he came up to me and decided, Pastor John, I want to do this um, class on media literacy. I feel like there's so much fake news out there and so people are, are, are it, it, it with, between f social media, Facebook and all this stuff. I'd like, you know, I have some experience in this. I'd like to, to, to offer a class for a few weeks for people to come and, 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 and when they're reading the newspaper, reading stuff online, to try to discern how to know if something is accurate or not. I thought, what a great idea. And that was for him coming from a place of, of faith, that, mm -hmm. that the truth and honesty is part of his faith and that it wasn't a political act so much, but it would have perhaps political implications um, that he wanted to help his fellow parishioners wade through some of this stuff. Um, I thought that was a great, and this man is not a politician or a, or a teacher or anything, but this is something that he does know about and, and thought it was, here's the way where my interest in my gifts can, can perhaps help other people. And oftentimes, you know, we, we, and I'm speaking specifically now to the black church, oftentimes, you know, we think um, everybody is well educated on the various rules and, and um, uh, uh, bills and laws that, that govern our lives on a daily basis. And sometimes people aren't, you know. Um, as, 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 you know, you, you spoke about the gentleman at your church, those of us who have knowledge where certain things are concerned, just randomly, which is what I've been doing lately, just randomly strike up conversation with people and, you know, ask random question. Hey, did you know that this, you know, if you do this, this happen, or if you don't do this? And you'd be surprised as to how little some people know or how much information some people have to give. And that those are ways of getting involved and getting, um, mobilizing other people to get involved. I think I love what all of you are saying. I love the idea of you know figuring out what you care about and then pursuing that. I also, um, I also think something that you said earlier about how polarized the conversation is. So many people, it's like a team sport. It's like you're either really far to the right or really far to the left, and you pick your team, and then you don't actually talk. You're in an echo chamber. You only talk to people and read news that agrees with you on each side, and then you think that everybody else is basically an idiot or the devil. <laughs> and I think that part of civic responsibility is actually about creating a real conversation and understanding that underneath all of the words and rhetoric, there are actual values at stake. And those values are often important and in conflict with one another. So it might be that there is a tension between um, you know, more free market and, and everyone having free choice and more equality for children. And it's not like the people that want equality for children hate freedom and the people that, that want f freedom of the markets and, and free choices hate children. It's that they're, they've kind of latched on to one or the other values. And so I think it's really valuable, and I don't think this is enough, you also have to take action, but just to ask people, how are you thinking about this issue? Why do you think that? What's behind it? And just keep asking like a three-year-old, you know, says, why, why, why? Just keep asking what's behind it. And, and if you don't agree with something, can you say more about it? And not with the goal necessarily of changing somebody's mind, but with the goal of coming to understand more why people think what they do. Because I hope that if those kinds of conversations happen, eventually there'll be a bit more of a middle way and more of a capacity for people to talk to each other and get anything done. Because when people are so far apart, it's like 
impossible to, to even move forward unless you just get the greatest number of people on your side. And I think that leaves a lot of people dissatisfied. You know, it, like in the past election, if either candidate had won, a huge percentage of America would have been extremely upset. It would be better if someone could get elected that people could sort of feel excited about. Um, so I think that's one thing is to have those real conversations. I think another thing is in addition to figuring out your passion, is figuring out what are the menu of things that people in the community are doing. Because I know for me, you know, I might be really, like I am a vegetarian. I'm passionate about being a vegetarian. But I kind of have figured out that that's not really going to work well <laughs> as like a campaign. I used to really try very hard to be like, do you realize what you're eating? And <laughs> this is what happened to this poor cow. And, you know, it made me not the most popular dining companion. So it's not that I don't care about it anymore, but I'm not going to spend my energy on it because I don't think that has traction. But on the other hand, I really care about everyone having economic dignity and all children having enough. And so right now I'm working on passing, um, raising the minimum wage and passing paid family leave so that people like me can take maternity leave when we have kids, which I have the privilege of doing, but I know so many women don't. Or if someone in your family or you face a serious illness or injury, like, do you have the opportunity to take time off? Now these things are things that the legislature didn't act on. So we called our legislators, we, you know, did the lobbying and it didn't do enough. But we have this opportunity in Massachusetts because we have referenda to do direct democracy. So even just signing a petition that you agree with is an act of civic responsibility. Or I've met a lot of people who just carry around a petition they agree with and say, you know, will you come, will you sign it? Um, or whatever is the group, if there's a group that shares your passion, even if it's not the only thing that you care about, you can work with those other people and get so much more done. I know that's a big reason that people get involved in ECHO, is that yes, they care about our issues, but may, you know, some people I talked to, they said, well, we'd really rather work on health care than work on minimum wage. But if there are thousands of people working on minimum wage, well, then that's what we're going to work on because we know that that's where we have the opportunity yeah. to make an impact. Right. Um, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, another piece is, as you mentioned, ECHO, there are so many community organizations um, that are involved in, uh, you know, civic engagements. Um, you know, get a list um, of your call, your local city hall, and get a list of the various organizations that are, that are in your area and, you know, call them up, find out what, what, what's their project, what is their main issue or focus of, um, of that time, and, you know, get involved some way, somehow, make phone calls, take an hour or two of your day, go to these offices, volunteer some of your time, because the fact of the matter is it doesn't matter what the issue is, it affects us one way or the other. And, you know, to quote Reverend Sprecher again, you know, uh, decisions are made by those who show up and even if you are not there a decision is being made for you you know what I mean so well and that's I, to piggyback on both like you I think there's the, the the two groups the people the polarization but there's also this third group that's just checked out mm. that is that sort of they're all corrupt this is all none of it matters nothing's ever going to change and sort of you know are essentially self disenfranchised from the process. They don't vote, they don't um, pay attention to what's going on, maybe because they've been burned or, or because they have encountered the sort of corruption or, or they had, maybe they were active in something and it, it, it didn't pan out, but, but there are... So toxic. And so to, right, and there are these who are... It's not that they don't have values, but it's that they've given up on the system. And those people all the more, just because you've checked out doesn't mean the system doesn't exist anymore. Right. That just means there's one less voice at the table. And you not voting is not making a statement. You, you know, um, sort of staying on the sidelines is, is it, it, it may f feel, you know, I don't know what it feels like, but, but please, it, that's, that's, that's why 
that's what allows the very corruption to exist. When, 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 when people know that, that only 10% of the, of the electorate is going to show up to vote, mm -hmm. when they know that they can say and do something on Monday and by Wednesday people will have forgotten about it or not care. That's what allows this to happen. And if more people were engaged then, and, and felt like their, their actions would actually have consequences, um, which is incidentally also a way that you combat narcissism, <laughs> uh, it, perhaps things would be not so hopeless. I think this, the other thing in regard to the polarization, uh, because of ECHO, we all know what grassroots organization can do, and uh, the conversation to eliminate the polarization looks like it's going to have to come from the grassroots, yeah. because we're not seeing good examples uh, from our uh, leaders. It's, that's in, uh, just emboldening the, the uh, polarization, I think. Uh, so that's where we can begin, is just on a grassroots level, I recognize that there are people who disagree, but we need to come together and, and to have that conversation, listen to one another, and, and move forward uh, and understand each other better. And I don't know, I don't know how to properly address those who have checked out, but you, you're right, there is such a large uh, percentage of the general population that have checked out checked out, you know, it's kind of like we throw our hands up, um, but what we find happening, and God help me here, what we find happening is when something or someone sounds or looks different, pops up on, this, on the scene, out of sheer desperation or finally he's or she's not singing the regular, the, 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 the regular tune, you know, we jump on that ship without, in fact, taking time to really listen to where that um, that individual is headed. And then we find ourselves in the situation that we're <laughs> currently in, <laughs> which is where I was going with that. Then we find ourselves into the situation which we're currently in. Um, and so if you find yourself getting to that place of, you know, I'm done, I'm over, I can't be bothered. If you find yourself getting to that place, find somebody and talk to, let someone know exactly how you're feeling and why you're feeling that way. Yeah, and I, I think whether you're somebody who has a strong opinion and needs to listen to the other side, or you're someone that feels like, I care, but there's no place for me, I hope that this show is inspiring people to take one step, to go 5% further this year, whatever that means, um, and really to just understand that we do have the capacity to impact our world, and we shouldn't let other people do it for us because um, as a saying in the Jewish tradition says, it's not up to you to finish the work of healing the world, but you are not free to quit. So with that, I want to say thank you for being uh, our viewers and we hope to continue the conversation with you next month.